Salutations, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me for another video. And do we have a big one for you today? I'm doing my running back rankings for week number two. And I'm bringing 34 running backs to you to try to get you as deep as possible and help you out with who I think is going to make the best options for your teams to dominate your opponents and continue to get dubs. Now, I am doing something maybe a little bit different. I'm going to try to kind of skim through the first 10, 12 backs or so. These are guys everyone's starting and everybody knows it. So I'm trying to spend more time getting you the information for some of these lower guys on the list where your decisions are actually gonna have to be made on who to start or sit. Now that being said, if you have questions, drop them down below. I will get to every single question and comment that I receive. I love the engagement. It is why I do it. So please get it started and throw something down below for me. Speaking of that, a like on the channel, a subscription would be greatly appreciated. It helps me out so very much. And I'm on my way to my first 500. You can be a part of it. So click the button so you not miss any content coming out. I have a ton of it moving forward. Every Wednesday, I'm going to be dropping quarterbacks and kickers as well as running backs. Every Thursday, I'm going to be dropping wide receivers and tight ends. I'll have content on Friday, which is buy, sell for those looking to make trades or moves to improve their teams. I also may have content on Saturdays as I do a start or sit, whether that's stock up and stock down, as far as who has changed in my rankings throughout the week. And I might also do weekly picks on Saturdays so you guys can come back, make fun of me when I get everything wrong. All right, enough of that. Let's hop into my running back rankings for week two. And we're going to start it off with a layup. It is Jonathan Taylor traveling to Jacksonville to take on the Jags. He showed last week why he was the true, undisputed, number one overall pick. He's going to continue to do what he does. To two, it is Austin Eckler in a Thursday night matchup against the Chiefs. He's probably going to get at least 20 touches, maybe more, and he's going to be in a shootout. So needless to say, I am in. At three, it's Dalvin Cook. He gets Philadelphia on the road, and I just love Minnesota's new look offense. It's enabling him to stay fresh, and that means every time he touches the ball, he is a touchdown waiting to happen. At four, it is none other than Saquon Barkley against Carolina. Now, I am not set to throw in the towel just yet. I made a video. I was down on Barkley heading into the draft weekend. But Saquon certainly made me look silly in week one. He time traveled back two years into the past and he looked really good. I love the matchup against Carolina. Rounding out my top five and maybe up there a lot higher than others have him is Nick Chubb. He gets a matchup with the Jets and it's pretty simple. The Browns do not want to throw the football. They have no intention of letting Jacoby Brissett do that. So that fits in just fine with what Nick Chubb likes to do. He balls again against the Jets. To six, it is Joe Mixon on the road against a Dallas team that is really hurting. I think the workload for Mixon in week one was absolutely insane with 34 touches. Cincinnati is going to dial that back, but I think the efficiency here improves and Mixon is going to hit pay dirt and pay off this ranking. My seventh ranked player, and a lot lower than I think many have him, is Christian McCaffrey against the Giants on the road. With Run CMC, it's all about Carolina's offense being pretty scary looking last week and not in a good way. It could certainly cap the upside that we see from him. But when he's healthy, we all know that all it takes for him is one touch, and that makes his week. At eight, I have DeAndre Swift at home against the Commanders. He absolutely tore up the Eagles. He racked up 175 total yards and he scored to get the week's RB3. And just imagine if he didn't have not one, but two one yard touchdown runs vultured, he would have absolutely crushed it. My ninth ranked player is Najee Harris at home against New England. We got a absolute terrifying event when the injury happened it looked like he might miss significant time. 
but it was just a scare. Harris may be limited a little bit against the Patriots. I still think that the Pittsburgh Steelers lean on him plenty, and as long as he is close to 100%, he will produce for you. Rounding out my top 10, I have Aaron Jones. He gets a matchup with the Bears. It was extremely worrisome for owners to see that he was so heavily outtouched by A.J. Dillon in week one. For now, I'm going to stay on Aaron Jones, but he certainly has to work to rebuild some trust that was broken from last week. All the way up at 11, I have Antonio Gibson traveling to Detroit. And you can call me crazy, but Gibby absolutely dazzled in week one, and he deserves this ranking, especially when we look at the Lions up on deck. He had 22 looks in total, and he had eight of those in the passing game. So maybe Washington finally figured it out by being forced to with the injury to Robeson, and that J.D. McKissick maybe not 100% and back yet. Rounding out my RB1s. For week two, I have Leonard Fournette. He travels to New Orleans. And this definitely could be a tough sledding game for him, but Atlanta seemed just fine on the ground last week. Cordero Patterson absolutely ate, so I am firing him up with confidence. Javante Williams is another guy that I am all about. He gets Houston at home. And no, the fumble last week was not great, and I get that. But everything else was for the man. He had 12 targets last week, which is absolute insanity, and it was a lot more than any owner could have possibly hoped for. He has top five upside this week, I think, against the Texans. All the way down and tumbling down my rankings, at 14, I have Derrick Henry. He travels to Buffalo, and I'm not going to say that I told you so just yet, but under four yards of carry against the Giants is not a great start. Buffalo is gonna make him earn every single yard, so you gotta hope here that he falls into the end zone or he makes a special play in space and loses someone. Alvin Kamara is next. He's my 15th ranked player. He gets that matchup with Tampa Bay. And he dropped an absolute dud in week one and it's not gonna get any easier in this matchup with the Bucks but he should at least see more usage in the passing game and that will raise his floor. My sweet 16 is James Conner in a matchup on the road against Vegas. And like Arizona's entire offense basically, nothing worked for Conner against the Chiefs. He did fall into the end zone and it saved his day. Vegas was not kind to Austin Eckler last week, but the touchdown upside here I think is enough to keep me confident in him as an RB2 finisher. A.J. Dillon is here at 17. He gets that matchup with Chicago, and he could quickly rise if we continue to see the touch split that we saw in Minnesota, and that becomes a trend for him. For now, we're just going to take that touchdown upside, which we love, and his newfound work, which seems to be consistent now in the passing game. At 18, I have Clyde Edwards-Alaire. He gets the Chargers on Thursday night. I love the scores. He had a pair of them receiving, but I hate the usage with only 10 total touches. I think CEH is going to need more work to consistently produce, but we're not gonna complain with the pair of touchdowns to start the year, and I think there are plenty of points scored on Thursday, and Clyde can take advantage of that. Tumbling to 19, I have David Montgomery with a matchup in Green Bay. Now, I'm going to give Monty at least a little bit of grace here because of the conditions last week were absolutely horrendous. But even if you are swimming in a lake, 1.5 yards per carry is not going to cut it. And he needs to improve on that because Khalil Herbert had no issues and averaged 5 yards per carry. Rounding out my top 20, I have Ezekiel Elliott at home against Cincinnati. For sure, no Dak means more Zeke. I think that that is fairly obvious. But how effective is Zeke going to be with nine defenders in the box? I tried to warn you prior to drafts, it could be tough sledding, but I think the volume might be enough to keep him afloat. Josh Jacobs is next up. He's at 21. And I think last week, a lot of it was game script that kept Jacobs on a leash, but he was productive with his opportunities. The Cardinals, they were unable to stop 
anything last week, so Jacobs could potentially flirt with RB1 numbers here if things break right. At 22, I have Rashad Penny. He travels to San Francisco, and I don't exactly love this matchup or the potential return of Ken Walker, so keep an eye on that if you are an owner. But I will say that Seattle's offense showed a lot more life than I was expecting in week one, and that gives me hope. I may pay for it, but I have Cordero Patterson at number 23. This is about the matchup here, and when you are the first player to run for 100 plus yards against New Orleans in well over a season, you are doing something absolutely right. Unfortunately, Rams. My last RB2 is Daryl Henderson Jr. against Atlanta. Now, if you were one of the wise people, at least looking like that right now, and you invested in him, he is the clear RB1 in LA for now. So enjoy it while it lasts. I am still holding on hope, and I'm a firm believer that this is Akers backfield to lose. But that is certainly not the case right now. So if you drafted Henderson, you are gonna get your money's worth this week. Throw him in there. Rounding out my top 25, I have Travis Etienne Jr. with a matchup with the Colts. Now last week was a bit of a shocker for me. He had just six total touches. That is not what you were hoping when you drafted ETN so highly. But I say do not lose hope just yet. He did average nearly 11 yards per touch and I think the talent here wins out eventually. To 26, I have Kareem Hunt, he takes on the Jets. He was buoyed last week by a pair of scores and he ended as the RB5 on just 15 touches, which is incredible. He is gonna be dangerous here once again in this matchup, but he is likely gonna be pretty touchdown dependent as anything more than a flex moving forward unless we see an injury to Nick Chubb. Miles Sanders is my next guy at the 27 spot. And unfortunately for him, he is the 1A in a brutal three-way running back by committee in Philadelphia. Four-way if you want to count Jalen Hurts, and you probably should. He did ball out last week for over 100 yards on 15 touches. But any potential chance at a score could be vultured at any time, and that caps his upside. Melvin Gordon is my 28th ranked running back. He gets that Houston matchup at home. And while his injury does not appear to be serious, we want to keep a very close eye on it as the week progresses. If he does play, he is a solid flex option. 29 sees Devin Singletary. He's got a matchup with the Titans. As the only Bills running back last week that could hold on to the frickin' ball, he can be flexed with confidence against the Titans team that ranks 27th against the run last week as Saquon Barkley ate them for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. To 30, I have Michael Carter. He travels to Cleveland. He had 19 opportunities last week. He racked up 100 total yards against Baltimore. So that is a thing of beauty for owners. And if he can do that against the Ravens, Perhaps Cleveland is not as imposing as we might think, so stay tuned. It is his backfield for now. To 31, I have Chase Edmonds. He gets those Ravens. And the only thing that matters if you are an owner of Chase Edmonds is that he was the clear RB1 for Miami last week. And when is the last time you got to say that? If that continues to be the case, he is going to have weeks with big upside, but this is not one of them to 32, and it's the newcomer Jeff Wilson Jr., fresh in off that Elijah Mitchell injury. He gets Seattle. Now, there's not a ton of upside for the running back in this rushing attack right now because I think and expect both Debo Samuel is going to get his in the backfield. We saw him rush it eight times for about 50 yards and a tutty last week, and we know Trey Lance is going to use his legs as well, but there is touchdown upside against the Hawks. Next up, at 33, I have James Robinson at home against the Colts. For now, Robinson is the lead back and he shows no signs of wanting to give up that label. He scored twice against Washington. Now I should probably flip him for ETN, but I'm gonna wait and see what week two brings and then adjust from there. The final back that I have as startable in this range is 34 and is Jamal Williams against Washington. And this is really about the goal line role 
as a running back in Detroit. If he can keep it, Williams is going to be a decent flex option more weeks than not. If you enjoyed the content today or you have in the past and you have not smashed that like button or the subscribe button yet, what are we doing here? Get on it. Help a brother out. I am always so appreciative. I will answer any questions, guys. So throw those down below. I want to help you out. Start, sit, trade, dynasty, whatever you got, I will get back to you. So get that conversation going. This is Relentless Press. I'm your host, Abrimo Pats, and we will see you.